everyone. I am Bashir Sefik, your moderator for today. Um, firstly, I would like to start by thanking each and every one of you for joining us today, um, taking time out of your precious weekend. I'd also like to thank the Altenbash University Medicine Club Presidency, Raja and Marwa, and also Zahir for um, his guidance. I hope the next two hours will be really full of um, information and knowledge that will impact your medical career. So as um, you can see on the agenda, we have four different speakers today. I will be speaking first. Um, I am an intern in Medical Park Hospital in Istanbul, Turkey. We have Dr. Devanshu Kwacha as well. Um, Dr. Devanshu is a clinical fellow in ENT surgery at University Hospital Coventry and Warwickshire in the UK. We have Dr. Bharat Pillai. Uh, Dr. Bharat recently matched into a neurology program at the University of Pittsburgh Hospital in the US uh, six days ago, to be precise. And we have Mr. Pawan, lastly. Uh, Mr. Pawan is director and mentor at US Emily Sarthi. US Emily Sarthi is an organization that um, has helped hundreds of IMGs get into the uh, United States residency program. can have uh, Mr. Pawan and Dr. Bharat mm -hmm. join us. Sure. Thank you. you. Uh, thank you, Bashir. Uh, first, am I audible? Uh, uh, yes, I can hear you. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, let me share the screen and then we will get started. So tell me if this is, uh, you guys can see this? Uh, yes, we can. Okay. Yes. So thank you for the opportunity and uh, we appreciate it. Uh, you know, it's always good to be part of a uh, school again. And I was listening to your introduction, Bashir, when you said, you know, projects and such things don't come to your table. You have to be proactive. You have to look for it and you have to build your own profile. And, and that's where the USMLE is, you know, as, as foreign medical graduates, uh, you can all do very well. You can come to the U.S. and get into residency, but it needs a lot of planning, not of uh, proactiveness and, uh, you know, your initiative. So our goal is to talk about all of that uh, today. And, uh, you know, I've been the director at USMLE Sarthi. I used to teach at Carnegie Mellon. I was a former program director there in healthcare oh, analytics. Uh, we've been helping IMGs now for over uh, six years. Uh, uh, today I have uh, Dr. Bharat Pillai with me. He is our student. He just matched in one of the most competitive uh, university programs in the U.S., University of uh, Pittsburgh Hospitals at uh, uh, Presbyterian Hospital in Neurology. So he, we, he will also talk about his experiences. Uh, in terms of the agenda, you know, briefly, of course, we'll, we'll talk about who we are. Uh, then we'll switch into how IMGs can get into the USMLE residency and what are those factors. Uh, so unlike the UK, the USMLE, as you probably know, is very well-defined path. There is only probably only one path. There are uh, slight variations when it comes to radiology and a couple of things, but pretty much the path is very well defined. So we'll talk about what determines uh, your match. And, and then Dr. Pillai is going to talk about step one preparation because that will be one of the core things you will end up doing very uh, in the very beginning. We'll talk about some of the other things like uh, implications of uh, pass fail and, and then some uh, you know, Q&A. So uh, USMLE Sarthi, we help applicants in all aspects of the match and we'll, we'll give you some free tools also. Uh, we do have a planner tool for exams. So there are, there are uh, you know, at least three exams you need. Step one, then USMLE, step two, CK. And there used to be step two, CS, but uh, it has been replaced now uh, temporarily by OET as the other speaker said also for England. So these are the top three exams which are needed for certification. And, and then of course, uh, there is another step three exam, not required for certification, but uh, good to have. So we'll talk about some of those as we, as we go forward. Uh, pretty much other things we help with is your ERAD application, personal statement. But before you go there, 
you know, your US clinical experience, your externships, uh, those kind of things we help with, and then everything around the match. So the USMLE system, after the exams, you have to prepare an application, you have to prepare a personal statement, you have to apply to the programs, you have to interview at the programs, and, and then you get a match. So that's where uh, we all help the IMGs, foreign medical graduates. Uh, we've held over 2,300 applicants, students from more than 32 countries now. Uh, we have a match rate, so success rate of over 87%. Our students uh, tend to come, uh, you know, with from various backgrounds. There are scores, lower scores, which is the USMLE scores to high scores. Uh, theoretically, I think you can get up to 300 in step one and CK. So. Uh, typically, I think 270 is a very high, very, very high score. So then there is year of graduation, um, different specialties. So we help uh, in all aspects. But let me switch gears and uh, then we'll, we'll talk about uh, what is this all, uh, you know, how you can get into the residency. So the IMGs historically have been doing very well in the USMLE match. So uh, I just want to, this is a chart as of 2020. So the 2021 results just came out uh, last week. Uh, so this is not updated, this is last year's, but still it, it is very similar. So on the, the first graph or the first line you see here is the US seniors. So uh, students who have done their med school in the US, right? Uh, American medical graduates is the term they use AMGs. Their match rate, their success rate is very high, almost 100%, it's more than 95%. Uh, then there are uh, another, another degree, osteopathic degree in the US. And uh, th their match rate you see in the blue line is also very high, you know, very close to 90, 95%. Uh, and, and then you're talking about the IMGs. So there is the US IMGs, there is the non-US IMGs. Uh, Non-US IMGs is where majority of you may fall. These are the students who need work permit, work visa uh, to do residency in the US. Uh, H1B, J1, uh, JB, uh, J clinical research visa, those kind of things. And then there are US IMGs practically uh, they they are either U.S. citizens or green card holders, but they did their resident or they did their medical school outside the U.S. Uh, both these match rates are now close to 60, uh, 60 percent. You know the pink line and the light blue line, which you may see here. Uh, uh, so the match rate is increasing for for the uh, IMGs, the foreign medical graduates. Now, if you need visa, these are the top specialties uh, that uh, students have been applying to and getting successfully matched. Uh, of course, a lot of this changes over the years, uh, you know, uh, specialty changes, the trends changes. Uh, but historically, as you can see, if you need visa, then internal medicine is the top specialty, more than half of the IMGs tend to match into internal medicine, so 51%. Uh, then some of the other specialties, uh, family medicine, so this is uh, you know related to internal, but as you know, it's, it's slightly different, more of primary care, GP kind of roles, so 10%. Pediatrics, eight. Neurology has been increasing, uh, now five to 6%. Pathology, also five to 6%. So these are the uh, main kind of uh, specialties. Uh, psychiatry has been growing. So all others are the other specialties. So psychiatry, which you don't see here, is increasing. Uh, dermatology, gen uh, you know, general surgery, uh, plastic surgery, all those are fewer, but increasing, right? So, uh, but, but this is the, you know, the internal medicine is still, still the largest uh, in terms of residency. Now, if you don't need a visa, if you uh, already have a green card or are you a US citizen, then these are the specialties that you will typically, you know, buy from the trend. So internal medicine has gone down. So 36% only in internal medicine. Family medicine, as you can see, you get more chances, a 25% match into family medicine. 
that is psychiatry, pediatrics, uh, emergency medicine, and, and then the, the rest, right? So that's where uh, the trend is if you do not need visa to work in the US, if you, uh, uh, you know, are a US IMG. Okay, then, uh, sorry, I'm trying to move to the next slide. Okay, now this is the core slide on which we build the rest of the presentation. What are the factors? What all do you need for a successful match? And Dr. Pillai is gonna talk about some of this in greater detail. Uh, but over, over the past 10 years or so, uh, what we have analyzed, right? What we have analyzed, what we've seen, what we've uh, practically distilled uh, is in this one slide. So one is the scores. Uh, when I say scores, I mean the USMLE step one score, uh, the USMLE CK score, step two CK, uh, step three also for, for many people. Scores are, are very important. Of course, uh, step one is going to go pass fail. So uh, that's something we'll talk about. But scores, excellent scores, if you can get, uh, you have won half the battle. Uh, what are a good scores? So uh, 240 plus in step one and in CK is a very good score. So uh, scores are important. Then what do you need for other parts of the, of the profile? is the US clinical experience. This is absolutely, absolutely required. Uh, last year, of course, uh, a lot of students could not travel to the US because of the pandemic. So a lot of this was done through telehealth, tele-rotations, but US clinical experience is, is something like you apply, like all of you in med school, you can apply for electives in the US uh, universities. Uh, you can come here, do four weeks, eight weeks of rotations. Uh, you can work along with the medical students from the US. You will work with the attendings. You will get an idea of the US healthcare system, the EMR system they use, how to interact with patients. So, so very, very valuable experience uh, on your CV. You should take it as absolutely important. US clinical experience. And it is very important if you can get it as a student, as a, still to graduate in your medical school student. You can still do it after you graduate, but the value kind of goes uh, down a bit. So try doing these experiences uh, in the medical school. And we'll, we'll share some links where you can get more information uh, about these experiences. Then is the visa. I mean, you know, like I spoke, there is the... Uh, people who don't need visa versus people who need visa. It is what it is. Uh, if you don't need visa, you can just apply to more programs. Overall, the match rate is what it is. If you need visa, there are different set of programs you become eligible to. But visa in itself has never been a constraint in the US. Uh, people, all kinds of people needing visa have done well. As I showed you, uh, match rate is close to uh, the non-visa seeking uh, applicants. Then the other thing as part of your application is letters of recommendations, the LORs by the short form. These letters typically have to be from US physicians, you know, who've been working here where you have done your US experiences, electives, etc. Uh, they have to be uh, very personalized. Uh, they have to be waived letters. Uh, if you are in your medical school, of course, uh, you know, one or two letters from your uh, medical school can also work very well. Uh, but out of the four letters, the, the, which are the requirements in your application, at least two should be from the uh, US faculty with whom you have rotated. So absolutely critical again. Then is the year of graduation and if you've taken break years, gaps, etc. Uh, pay careful attention. Year of graduation is important. You really want to get into the US system as early as possible, as soon as you graduate. The more uh, years you spend not coming here. So let's say you graduate in 2021. So as, as long as you apply in 2022, 2023, 
you should be fine. But you know, more than three years, more than five years of gaps really begin to hurt you. They are strongly preferring in all specialties recent graduate. And Dr. Pillai is an example. You know, he's just graduated, very recent graduate. So the more recent graduate you are, the chances of you getting into the system and chances of getting trained at our top program are very high. It is not that if you are an older graduate five years ago, so on, you cannot match. We have had students match with 20 plus year of graduation. It just gets harder. There are a lot of things you need to do addition. Then of course, the, the other thing that the U, US system, USMLE system, as you get ready to apply in addition to your LORs in addition to scores, etc. Uh, there is a, an application, a standardized application. It is called ERAS application. It includes your CV. It includes your personal statement, personal statement about 700 words, less than a page, uh, why you want to come to the US, why you want to do this specialty, so on and so forth. So uh, the ERAS CV and the personal statement along with the letters, along with articulating your US clinical experience. It's a portfolio uh, that you submit. Very important, uh, not only from the perspective of, uh, you know, the attention to detail, how you articulate your experience, but it all has to show your fit. So all of it has to come together. What else is included in, in your application, which can uh, swing the match for you is demonstrated research experience. So any research, that you do in your medical school or otherwise is important. Obviously, if you can publish, um, that is awesome. Uh, so get involved in your medical school with faculty, you know, uh, any projects that they are involved in, whether your role is data gathering, hypothesis generation, analysis, very, very important. Learn, if you can, tools like SPSS, SAS, learn to analyze uh, data sets. Uh, this will all come in very, very useful as you prepare for your uh, USMLE journey. Last but not, not the least, before I hand it over to Dr. Pillai, is your interview performance. The USMLE system is unique in the sense that in addition to all this, you know, your scores, your application, your uh, uh, letters, your uh, research experience, all that, uh, when you apply to the programs, uh, they will select applicants to interview. So what happens is uh, that the USMLE system for IMGs, uh, it's a very competitive system. The match rate is 60%. But let me give you one example. Let's say a, a program has 20 spots for, for residents. Uh, what they will get, uh, let me take internal medicine example, what they will get for those 20 spots is about 5,000 applications, right? So they about for 20 spots, about 5,000 applications, then they filter down those applications based on scores and other aspects that I've outlined, you know, how much experience do you have, uh, how strong are your LORs, et cetera, et cetera, all those kind of things they will filter it down then from from that 5000 number they may come down to 200 so then these 200 people are the applicants they are going to interview okay uh, so they are going to interview these 200 people and that's where interview becomes very important of course uh, this season this past season everything was on zoom virtual you didn't have to travel but of course, uh, in, a, in a normal year, pre-pandemic, and hopefully when we get over this pandemic, it'll be uh, on-site. So it is on-site. I'm sorry, there is some uh, disturbance. Thank you. Uh, so you have to travel uh, to the US, uh, you know, you have to travel to the program and interview on-site in a uh, normal year. Uh, so then they interview you, you know, this is um, a series of maybe three to four interviews at a program, 15, 20 minutes each, uh, can be group interviews, can be individual interviews, you meet the program director, you meet the other faculty, uh, why do you want to come to US, why this specialty, why this program, 
tell me about yourself. So there is a list of questions, uh, you know, we have on our website, we can point you to those. But the interview experience is also very critical because they have to filter down from those 200 to the top people that they are going to uh, select. So after the interview performance, there is something called a match. This is an algorithm where programs will put uh, their top rank pro, uh, applicants in the system in the order of ranking. And applicants also rank the programs where they have interviewed in the order of preference. Uh, uh, algorithm is run and you as an applicant are matched to one program. And, and, the, and the program, if they have 10 spots, hopefully they get 10 applicants. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, all the factors uh, that are important for the match. Now I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Pillai uh, from uh, my team. And uh, if the organizers can take care of this scratch, I think someone is playing with the system here. So... If you can just take care of all this, I don't know what is going on uh, with the system, but uh, so Bharat, if you want to just uh, take control now. Sure. Uh, thank you, Pavan. Uh, hi, everyone. Really glad to be here. Uh, I am quickly just going to share my screen over here. And uh, we have a relatively large uh, volume of information to go through in a small time. So uh, I hope I can take the questions uh, towards the end. And uh, hopefully everyone can see my screen here, if that's okay. Yeah. Uh, am I am I audible? Is it good? Yes, sir. Yes, you okay. are. Thank you. So uh, yes, as as Pawan outlined, this is uh, roughly about how the the application to the U.S. residency goes through. Uh, so I would like to. Um, ignoring the the drawing on the screen, I would like to think of it as a pyramid where the scores form the majority of the application. So about 70% of the importance to your profile comes from your scores. So it's extremely crucial to make sure you score well on the US MD exam. After which the, the hierarchy of importance goes, the US clinical experience, the, the quality of your LORs and the amount of research that you have. Uh, so scores, uh, step one scores have been historically the most important part. Uh, as, uh, as Pavan said, uh, an internal medicine program receives a large amount of applications. So most program directors tend to keep this filter. So for instance, if they decide to only view applicants more than say a score of 220, anyone below that, regardless of how good the application is, the, the, the application is just not looked at and you're potentially losing out on interview invites that, that come in. Uh, so as, uh, as you already know, there's three exams. Uh, step two CK is usually taken after step one, but not necessarily in that order. Uh, step one is going pass and fail uh, uh, starting January 2022. Uh, we don't know when exactly, but it will still uh, be a three digit score till January 2022 at least. So um, I'll just talk a little bit about step one and how to prepare for it. Uh, uh, the most ideal time to give step one is probably at the end of your second year, because uh, most of the subjects that you uh, that the step one classically tests you on preclinical subjects that is usually covered in the first and second year of medical school for most IMGs, but uh, Uh, hi, I think I'm muted, but uh, it is completely okay if you could not take your step one after second year, you always have time to take it uh, later with, with good preparation when I'm ready to take the exam. Now, um, uh, these are the, the exams in order that are required to for your USMLE application to go through. So on an average, step one takes between seven to nine months to, pre to, pre to, uh, to prepare for, and you need to have a very good command of the basic sciences for, for you to take the exam. Uh, it is a one day, eight, lar eight hour long exam. It is divided into seven blocks of each, uh, of, of one hour each. Once you start a block, you cannot pause it, but you do have one hour of break time that you can take in between blocks. So uh, this is the schema of how the step one exam is. We'll be sharing these slides with you at the end of the presentation. So uh, don't worry about that. 
Um, these are the most heavily tested concepts on step one. Pathology, pharmacology, and physiology form the major bulk. But please keep in mind that it is not pure pathology or pharmacology that is tested. It is usually the interplay in between two subjects that is the most high yield for the exam. So you need to have very good mastery of each of the preclinical subjects for you to perform well on the exam. And as you all know, the, there is some content change in the step one with step two CS being canceled. Uh, there is more emphasis on uh, the social uh, sciences and communication and interpersonals in the step one exam. So that is something to be cognizant about uh, as your assembly is trying to incorporate more of communication based questions into the theory based exams. Uh, patient care management is also going to be important. Uh, and has been important starting October of, of last year. And here you can see the classically, the better you score, the more probability of matching. So if you have a score of more than 250, uh, your probability of matching is, is more than 90%. But of course, it's not all black and white. There's a lot of, lot of more things that go into the application that I'll be talking about. But the bottom line is you should probably try to score uh, as well as possible for this step one. Uh, so, uh, just a brief outview of the resources that are usually used for step one. Uh, this is the bill of, of step one. It's called the first aid. It's a 500 page book, uh, which every IMG should go thoroughly. Uh, we recommend going through it at least three or four times and basically memorizing uh, every possible paragraph if, if at all it comes to that. Uh, it is a popular resource and it is uh, supplemented with a question bank. Uh, which is the U World, the U Western Bank. It is a paid resource. It's available online. Uh, the Step One Question Bank, uh, as of now, is composed of around 2,800 questions. And uh, we recommend going through each of the questions at least twice uh, to make sure you have uh, a good mastery of the concept. So uh, it's important to solve and review every question in U World. And it's it's at the at the at the end of the day it comes into test taking skills so you need to have that speed to make sure you are able to answer a question in 60 to 65 60 to 65 seconds uh, and of course uh, once we start taking the exam uh, you will have uh, instances where you end up picking answers leads where everyone else apparently seems to get it right but don't worry don't feel bad we all start off at the same place and progressively get better at it uh, boards and Beyond is also another gold standard resource that uh, we recommend to supplement uh, the U World Question Bank and is, is very high yield for, for Step 1 related preparation. Um, uh, we also recommend Pathoma uh, and as you already saw about 50% of the exam up to 50% of the exam can be only patho pathology and pathophysiology based so we recommend Pathoma it's a it's a resource available by a pathologist out, uh, based out of Boston his name is uh, Dr. Sutter and his his website is pathoma.com that uh, I would recommend every IMG aspiring for the US assembly to to definitely check out so uh, U-World, First Aid, Pathoma, and Boards and Beyond should form the core, uh, the, the cornerstone of your preparation material. And I would recommend that you, you dedicate 80% of your time to it. At the end of uh, using these, these study material to prepare, there are some assessments that are available, both U -world, uh, uh, on, on uworld.com and NBMEs. These are paid assessments. Uh, there are six of them as things stand. Uh, which we also recommend taking to see how uh, how well you're progressing on the preparation timeline and to uh, to know where you're going wrong because both of these self assessments are uh, either based based on retired questions or are written by the content writers who write the questions for the US USMLE exam so the questions on this uh, will uh, simulate the real world exam to a large extent so these uh, both are highly recommended as well uh, there are six practice exams which are available online that you can go to nbme.com and, and see, uh, as are the UWorld self-assessments. Um, these are also some of the resources that you can supplement if you feel you are lagging on one of the subjects. Uh, these are additional resources, but please, please, please uh, note that First Aid, Pathoma, uh, Boards and Beyond uh, should form the cornerstone of your preparation material. And this is just the icing up of the cake, nothing more. Um, as, as, as I said, uh, you will first in and Pathoma should form the bulk. And only if you do only three of these and decide not to do anything else, you will you should still comfortably get more than a 245 on the exam, which is at the 85th percentile. Uh, 
planning your study schedule is very important because there's a large amount of information to go through uh, many number of times. So we recommend it dividing into two phases, the preparatory phase and the revision phase. Uh, the preparatory phase takes about three fourths of your time uh, during which you'll first do a quick read of first aid followed by uh, the U World Question Bank at least twice. And this is where you'll form you the, the foundation of your step one exam. This will be followed by the revision phase where you'll be trying to go through as many questions as possible to solidify those test taking skills. It is at this time that we also recommend taking NBMEs and seeing how you're progressing along the journey. Uh, we do offer a, a planner on, on our website, USMLA Sati as well. We do have a, a trial version that we recommend all of you checking out. As I said, uh, planning the operation is the most important aspect of this journey. And uh, I, we, I, I strongly recommend you check out this planner. Um, uh, the best time to take the test is, is when you're within a 10 point range of your test score based on your self assessments. And as we all know, step one is going pass or fail. It has some implications to it. Um, I realize that I've run out of time, but I'll just take a, a few more minutes to, to kind of just go through the information. Uh, so with step one going pass or fail, uh, more emphasis is likely to be given to step uh, to the step two score. Uh, and it is also proposed or we hypothesize that IMGs may have a harder time getting through uh, based on, uh, on, on the other aspects of the application. But that's no way to say that it's become impossible. It just means that you have to pay more em uh, emphasis and dedication to your CV, the US clinical experience and rotations to make sure you do well and, and match. Uh, so the way I look, of, look at it is, if you compare two people uh, who say that they're lifting rocks, it's hard to quantify which person is stronger, right? So it's uh, always better to have a three digit score in your hand to make sure that you do well on the exam and make sure you maximize your, your, uh, your chances to match. Uh, U.S. clinical experience, as we know, uh, comes in uh, many shapes and forms. The hands-on clinical experience is always preferred to the, the, the pure observation and tele-based rotation. Uh, the ones on the left, hands-on clinical rotations. Uh, Tele-rotation is something that has come in new uh, over, the, over the past few months. Uh, we only recommend uh, tele-rotations to people who have an otherwise competitive profile, have had some U.S. clinical experience and just want to diversify the clinical exposure. But of course, we have had people who have matched with only tele-rotation based clinical experiences. Uh, strong LORs, of course, play a huge role in the application. It should be written by someone who is well-established and has directly overseen your work. Uh, and uh, its, it's, uh, its importance cannot be underestimated here. Um, uh, coming to research, it's becoming ex increasingly important to, to match, especially more so into the specialty branches. Uh, specialty specific research is preferred and at the end of the day, it's a numbers game. The more number of research papers and publications you have better, and it should be preferably in, in the PubMed or PubMed central index journals. Uh, and that is how a thing go the things goes. Uh, coming to visa requirement, 90% of the IMGs match on a J1 visa. It is also possible to match on an H-1B visa, but uh, it requires you to take step three before the match. Uh, the, the only uh, downside to it being you need not do the J-1 visa, the J-1 waiver that you would otherwise have had to do if you went on a J-1 visa. Uh, interview day performance, as, as uh, Pawan said, cannot be underestimated. It's becoming extremely crucial. And if you look at the NRMP data, you see that a large majority of, uh, of the factors that determine a successful match come down to how well you do on your interview day. Uh, and these are just a few resources. This is my last slide that uh, are, we have made available for the IMGs. We have a USMLE Sarthi YouTube channel that we recommend everyone check out. We, uh, we post videos uh, every week uh, pertaining to IMGs and a successful match in the US. Uh, so please check that out, definitely. Uh, we have a step one planner uh, to help you plan your preparation through the step one, uh, to, uh, through the step one preparation phase to, to help you on what resources to use and how to go about it. Uh, we do have a step one discussion group on Telegram. Uh, the links will be posted in the chat and please feel free to join the Telegram groups moderated uh, and we're helping IMGs every day to help manage and uh, also follow our Instagram and, uh, and uh, see all the, the data that we post there.
will be going through the major points of the CV building blocks and I wouldn't go through things, um, for example, like uh, if you should leave your CV in a PDF format or in an MS Word, or if you should highlight your name in a bold. And I'm sure the other doctors as well will probably not have enough time to talk about discrimination or bullying in healthcare systems and the pension scheme or the salary or which specialty is better than which specialty. And um, I will also have a presentation, a short presentation and then I'll answer the questions that um, all of you sent us on the registration form you registered for the event. Dr. Devanshu will do the same. Uh, he will have a short presentation about the UK's training pathway and then we'll answer questions uh, that you sent us on the registration form. And then the Dr. Bharat and Mr. Pawan will do the same. We'll have a short 10 minute break and um, then we'll have a live Q&A session. So these questions, uh, from the Q&A session will be taken from the questions that you ask us as we are presenting. So please feel free to ask any question um, that you have as we are presenting. And then these questions will be used in the live Q&A session. Um, and I guess with that, let's start. So give me a second to get my presentation on. So um, the CV, which will be my topic for today. There's a background story to this, but I'll try and keep it very, very short. So basically there I was in my fourth year of medical school and um, right after my final examination, just uh, before I got into the fifth year. And it was at that point that I um, was getting questions from my family members, colleagues and friends about uh, which specialty I wanted to go into and um, uh, where I wanted to practice. I wanted to go back to my home country in Nigeria or go to another country. And um, up until this point, I've been a medical student that uh, just takes each exam um, at a go. I basically uh, try and pass each exam, holiday, come back and repeat the same process for the past four years. Now it was at this point that I decided to do some research about how the process is in Nigeria. And um, apparently I only had to pass one exam or so I thought. And then I decided to dig deeper into the surgical specialties and um, go on YouTube and check out some videos on surgery. So I expected to see um, videos about how much surgeons get paid and um, their work-life balance and how many hours they have to work. And I was actually, uh, I got the shock of my life when I found out that I have to have a CV to get into the training program and I have to have a portfolio and attend this number of courses. and. Um, conferences and um, all that. So to cut the story short, uh, this is the main reason we held this webinar today. We are holding this webinar today. So the CV curriculum vitae or vita, depending on how you want to pronounce it. Um, what is a CV? A CV is simply a document um, that summarizes your professional and academic history and skills. Um, this document uh, you might have to submit to an employer if uh, you're trying to apply for a job and um, there's a document that is really similar to the cv that is the resume uh, but quick this, um sorry the screen is not moving okay um quick disclaimer some countries use these um, documents interchangeably so you can use both the cv and the resume but i believe in most countries um, these documents are different so i decided to iron out uh, these documents. So the resume is a brief and concise um, document. It's usually one page, but it could be two pages depending on who the person is and um, well, where you're applying to. Um, the resume also summarizes your uh, skills and um, academic achievements, but it mostly emphasizes skills rather than academic achievements. It's usually used specifically for job applications. While the CV is a more comprehensive document, uh, it could be two pages or longer, you can have um, a doctor that has been in the um, process for about 30 years that has six, seven, eight pages um, on the CV. And um, it's usually used for academia, it's education, science, medicine, or research. 
and um, it mostly emphasizes on academic achievements and your experience rather than your skills. So, uh, okay. So now I'm going to talk about the medical CV structure. Um, I'd like to point out that uh, point out that this is not the only uh, CV structure. You can use any CV structure that um, you can find, but I decided to include um, things that uh, decent medical CV, if not most all uh, decent medical CVs will have these subheadings that I'll be talking about today. So the academic degree is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, academic degrees has to do with um, anything uh, from your medical degree, the degrees you got before, and also the degrees that you got after. So any degrees that you got before, for example, some people tend to go into physiotherapy or pharmacology, and um, they get their degrees in that field, then they decide to go into medicine those degrees actually count uh, towards this section on your CV. Um, we also have intercalated bachelors and masters. This is not really common um, in some parts of the world, but I think it is in the US um, where you get other degrees together with your medical degree. I can also add your master's in research, MRES, or higher education degrees like PhD and MD degrees, which you get after you finish medical school. Okay, so I'll be moving on to presentation now. Um, on the right hand side of the screen, um, I have screenshots in some of the slides. Um, these screenshots were taken from the internal medicine training website of the UK. These screenshots will only be used as a reference. Um, so it might be different in that internal medicine training of the US. I will also be posting the link in the chat box below. Um, of the website and then you can check it out for yourself. So presentations are split into oral and poster presentations. Oral presentations generally carry more marks um, as they are hard to um, get into and also to organize and to speak in front of an audience than poster presentations. Um, sorry, I have to move this below. Okay. Uh, than poster presentations. Um, as you can see here, an oral presentation in which I was first or second author given an international or international medical meeting carries eight points, while a poster presentation usually takes five points. Um, as I said before, this is only used as a reference. It might be different in other pathways. So oral presentations and poster presentations, I, uh, the points on the CV are usually awarded uh, based on how wide you can reach. So an international um, presentation presenting at an international conference will definitely not get the same points as presenting um, in a local medical meeting or setting. So uh, you, can uh, you can present at an international conference, at a seminar, or you can also present just within a local healthcare setting or a meeting. Now, research and publications. This is the most asked about uh, section of the CV. Um, the Altenbach University Medicine Club actually has a section dedicated to this. And um, you can stay up to date with any events uh, from that section on our Instagram or uh, Facebook pages. So research publications, you can either go into original research publications and um, which involve randomized control trials or case studies, or you can go into writing like medical book chapters. As you can see on the right as well, um, a person that has written at least 50% of a book related to medicine uh, actually gets the same points as someone that has a PubMed cited original research publication or in press. So in press articles or publications um, actually involve, uh, basically mean any publication or article that is about to get published, but it's not out there yet. You can include this in this section of the CV. Uh, you can also get into medical book chapters or conference abstracts. You can write chapters or write the entire book or 50% of the book if you can. And um, it goes all the way down to um, getting non-peer reviewed articles or published articles that are not PubMed cited. So we also have teaching. Um, personally, I believe teaching is one of the easiest things you can get on your CV, um, especially as a senior medical student. So as a senior medical student, you can decide to uh, tutor junior medical students or teach them any topic or uh, any subject they, you're, they're interested in. So uh, you can also teach as a doctor, um, I'll give an example, as a doctor, you can decide to teach medical students, interns or other doctors or other healthcare personnel like nurses, um, how to 
you know, take ECGs or um, IV cannulation or ultrasound um, scans, for example. Uh, you can also decide to teach the public life support, let's say for CPR or gunshot wounds, stab wounds and all that. You can also decide to teach as part of a society or a committee, or you can decide to teach um, students directly um, or healthcare professionals. I will explain at the end of my presentation how you can prove you did these things and how to keep track of everything. So again, we have awards and prizes. Um, I went through medical school with this phrase at the back of my head, which is, if you pass your exams, the grades don't really matter in medical school, that the honors don't matter, but apparently they do. Again, on the right side of the screen, um, any achievement or award you get for your primary medical qualification, that is honors your first class, um, second class degrees, any distinction that is awarded to you, you get points for that. University merits as well. Um, some universities tend to award scholarships to some students that um, finish at the top of their class, for example, in each academic session. So these scholarships can actually be added towards this um, section of your CV. Also, if you apply for grants for any research or any course or conferences, and those grants get accepted, then you can definitely add them uh, on your CV. If you get involved in any medical essay competition, um, and you get a prize or any prize at the national level that you get related to medicine, you can add this on your CV as well. Then we come to audits and quality improvement projects. So this might not be really common here, but I think it really is in the UK and Dr. Devanshu might touch up on this. And it seems complicated, but it's really simple. So audits uh, compare current healthcare practice with a recognized standard. And I'll give an example, so it makes more sense. So this is an audit cycle. Um, we'll, let's take the emergency departments as an, as an example. So in the UK, um, no patient should wait uh, more than four hours in the emergency department without being seen by a doctor. And that is the standard and that's the guideline. So you measure your current practice and in your hospital, um, let's say patients get to wait six or seven hours sometimes, you then measure the current practice, you compare it with the set standards or guidelines, and then you find out what the issue is by analyzing the data. So let's say the issue has to do with either more equipment or you need more staff, let's say porters to push, to push the patients around or more cubicles. Then you uh, reflect on the plan and change, you get an action plan and present it to the management. If the management accepts your request, then you um, execute the action plan and then we audit to see if it worked. So basically you're trying to find a fault in the practice. You um, compare it with the guidelines and set standards. After comparing, you get an action plan and execute the plan and then check if the plan worked. Now with quality improvement projects, um, it basically improves quality of care. What you do is you identify the issue just like audits, um, but you don't necessarily have to compare with any standard or any guideline. So you get, to, um, let's say for example, at the emergency department as well, as a medical student, as an intern or a doctor, you notice the nurses go back and forth between the cubicles and the nurse station just to check the dosage of a very commonly used painkiller, like morphine, for example. So your plan would be, how can the current process be improved? Um, your plan would be to print out the dosing of these drugs and paste them in every cubicle. So you write that down, you uh, write down your action plan, present it to the management. If the management agrees, you execute the plan and you review and see if it works, just like with the audit, that you audit, you review this and see if it worked. So these um, are really two great things that improves healthcare and also adds to your CV. Now, leadership and management, just like with um, presentations, leadership and management. Uh, the points are actually usually awarded based on how wide you can reach. So if you hold a leadership role at an international level, let's say um, an international surgeon committee, for example, versus holding a leadership role in um, the sports club of your university, they are both roles and they both uh, will be added on your CV, but they hold different values. So you can hold a leadership role in a medical school committee, you can hold it in a hospital committee and also non-medical roles. As you can see here, you can um, hold any leadership position in a charity, scouting guides, uh, sports, creative arts at any local or regional level or also at a national level. 
Um, the main thing with leadership roles is you have to show how um, it has impacted you as a person, as we can see here. You have to demonstrate a positive impact um, to show that uh, it has impacted you. And we can get to the commitment to medicine. These are passive things that you can do um, as a medical student or a doctor, um, attending conferences and seminars, courses, uh, medical society memberships, and um, clinical attachments and observerships. So as a medical student that wants to get into surgery, for example, I would attend conferences and seminars that have to do with surgery. I'd also uh, try and attend a course that would teach me how to suture, for example. If I want to get into emergency, I'll, I'll go into courses that would teach me how to um, perform ECGs and also basic life support courses or acute life support courses with CPR, because I want to get into that specialty. So this really shows your commitment to that specific specialty. I'd also like to recommend um, every medical student to um, try and organize clinical attachment observerships every summer holiday. So here in my university, we get about three months of holiday in the summer. So I'd suggest if you can take six weeks on and six weeks off of uh, clinical attachments, if you're trying to get into surgery time and get a clinical attachment with a surgeon so you can get more time in the operation theater. And to doctors that unfortunately aren't working at the moment due to maybe lack of jobs or anything, you can also um, keep your medical knowledge afresh by attending clinical attachments and observerships. Uh, finally, we get to non-academic achievements. So these are uh, achievements that you can add that will show your individual characteristic uh, skills. It can be anything from charity organizations, sports, uh, languages, traveling, writing, blogging. If you have a blogging channel on YouTube, if you are a social media influencer, anything goes here. Um, and this is one side of the CV that most people neglect because we think we have to be great doctors to get the job but um, you're a person before a doctor. Anyway, so I got a question from the registration form on Google Forms. And the question is, how do you make a strong CV? I personally believe you get a strong CV by doing these six key things. So first, you have to be proactive. Um, the research projects, the conferences, the certificates um, won't come on your table with your name on them. You have to search, you have to ask someone that has been through the process, that doctor that has a big stack of research products on his table with his name on it, ask him if you can get into the rest, uh, the next research project, if you can, if you can teach you how to do that, if you can teach you how to get into the international society memberships and everything. Now, initiative, we have to take initiative sometimes. You have to start the medicine club at your university. You have to start that charity group, get a group of friends and tell them you um, should make a charity group. You have to um, chase those medical students and ask them if they need help with their anatomy classes so you can um, get a teaching program done. Personal drive, I think it really depends on the individual person. Um, so whatever it is that is pushing you to finish medical school and get a job, I think is your personal drive. So for example, if you're trying to finish medical school to get a job, to get money to help your parents, you're trying to finish medical school, get a job um, to treat patients or to get money and live a lavish lifestyle, whatever it is, that should be your personal drive uh, to get an outstanding CV. Now on the right, um, keep in track, as I mentioned before, um, I'll let you guys know how you can keep track and how you can prove. So how do you prove if you did teaching programs or if you attended the seminar or a conference? Um, basically, the best way you can do that is if it involves a university or involves an organization or um, it's part of a conference or, uh, with a formal standard, then you can get a signed certificate or a document stating that you did this exact thing and that's all you need. But in the case where you cannot do that, or you did uh, basically teaching programming, for example, between you and the students, you can print out the presentations, you can print out the teaching programs. You can also get formal feedback from those students. Um, it could be in form of a Google form or a printed sheet, and you can staple them together and keep them aside. Now, you have to have a work-life balance. You don't want to be that um, um, fifth year medical student that is trying to get five research projects done, with, you know, working for three charity groups on the weekend uh, just to get a good CV. 
And also, you don't want to be a first, second year medical student that is neglecting his studies just to get an outstanding CV, doing so many research projects and uh, training programs and so on. You also have to know when to relax and um, when to enjoy. Now, with flexibility, this also mostly applies to us um, as, a, as an intern, fifth year, sixth year medical student. Um, if you have a blank CV at the moment, uh, you don't have the luxury of choosing what you want to get into. If you get the opportunity to get into a research program, for example, just get into it. You might like it. If you think you're not really good with public speaking, I don't think I'm really good with public speaking, but here I am trying to help other medical students. Um, just get into something. It's the same with the first or second year medical students, third year as well. Um, just get into something you might like it uh, flexible don't be too picky with your choices and um, that's the end of my short presentation now i'm going to answer some questions that i got from the registration form and uh, just give me a second so the first question is is it important that you have a music album a sports license or something like that in your cv can we write these things on our cvs and yes, you absolutely can. So what we don't understand as uh, students or doctors is that these employers have been doing this for years and um, they look at things differently. So to you um, working in a charity group, for example, um, that has to do with children that went through traumatic experiences like war. And you talk to these kids and listen to them. To you, it's just being in a charity group. To the employer, they see someone that is kind-hearted and someone that um, someone that is kind-hearted and someone that has good communication skills to be able to talk to other people that went through traumatic experiences. Now, um, with the sports license or being captain of a uh, sports team, for example, to you, it's just your hobby. Uh, to the employer, there are eleven people on a football pitch, for example, and you are the captain of the entire team. There's a reason you're the captain. You have to have leadership skills for you to be the captain. So anything goes on, on your CV, anything you can. Now, the, another question is, I hope the speakers will make their PowerPoint slides accessible to everyone. I hope my request will be given due consideration. Your request was given due consideration. And um, I'm going to speak for myself. My slides will be accessible to anyone. If you want to use um, my slides as a checklist for your CV goals, or you want to do more research based on the subheadings that I put here in the presentation, feel free. I'll be sending um, emails to the participants, all the participants sometime next week. Just reply um, with, by requesting my uh, for the slides and I'll send it back to you. Now, lastly, as I've run out of time, I would like to end by saying everything that I've mentioned today. Um, as a medical student or as a doctor, you can start tomorrow. There's no reason why you can't start tomorrow you can um, do more research tomorrow try and find those students try and get into those research programs try and ask those doctors how you can do this and do that and um, there's literally no reason why you can't and um, with two minutes left uh, i'll end my presentation here those were the only questions i got from the registration form the rest of the questions were about the club and the usmd um, so i'll let dr devanchu take over dr devanchu So uh, the topic of my presentation today is Pathway to the UK. Hopefully it should be useful to people who are seeing it. And uh, so first of all, uh, what we are gonna discuss today is uh, the different pathways uh, to enter the UK healthcare system, NHS to be precise. And uh, unlike USMLE, in which uh, there is a defined path, as in step one, step two, and then uh, you go for OET or step three and apply for the match. In UK, there are many ways to enter the system at various points in your career. So uh, we'll discuss that briefly. And uh, we'll talk about, a little bit about IELTS or OET, which, is, uh, which are the English proficiency exams you need to take. Plab one and plab two following that, uh, which I think majority of the medical students are interested in today. And uh, after that, the Royal College route, uh, this is the route which I took to enter the UK. This one is especially uh, uh, important to someone who has already practiced in their country, uh, maybe did a house job for two to three years, and they're interested in one particular speciality. 
and uh, uh, they are not interested in the other specialties. For example, someone who loves surgery and uh, uh, just surgery and is not interested in medicine at all. This one makes more sense. Uh, following that, we'll uh, learn a little bit about the GMC registration and uh, and uh, a little bit about how uh, specialty training in UK works in general. So it varies from speciality to speciality, but uh, broadly, we will talk about how it's divided. And uh, CV tips uh, already has been discussed, but maybe I can add something to that. So, so uh, the PLAB examinations uh, uh, is the most common route, which is followed by the medical graduates to enter U uh, UK healthcare system. So you can uh, think of it as something similar to USMLE. What it essentially does is it gives you the, uh, it makes you eligible to apply for the GMC registration. GMC being the General Medical Council, which is the medical council uh, uh, nas uh, nationwide. Uh, the other route is the postgraduate qualification route. So if you have already done your post-graduation in a uh, particular speciality in your home country, uh, you might want to take this route. And uh, this is also the Royal College uh, route. So you finish your post-graduation in your country, take the MRCP or MRCS examination, and then uh, enter directly at a relatively senior post in the NHS. And then following that, you can always apply for a training post. The third is the CESA route, uh, which uh, stands for Certificate of Eligibility uh, for Specialist Registration. Now, this is something which uh, might interest a person who has an experience of, say, seven or eight years. What it essentially is, uh, uh, it will give you uh, a direct entry into the specialist register. Uh, that is, uh, you can directly be a consultant in the UK without uh, uh, going through the training program. But uh, again, this is for someone who has worked in their country for a long, long time. Uh, you need to prove your competencies. There are, there are certain criteria to be fulfilled. And uh, following that, you get the entry into the specialist register. Uh, and fourth is the sponsorship route. Now, this is uh, this makes more sense for someone who already has some contacts in the UK, I would say. So what it essentially means is the hospital is uh, ready to give you a job. And uh, following that, uh, they, uh, uh, they can sponsor you. What it means is they'll give you a letter, which is also known as the certificate of sponsorship. And uh, you can skip every exam. You can skip lab. You can skip the MRCS or the MRCP exam and directly come to the UK. All you need to do is take the OET or the IELTS examination. Very rare, but I've seen people uh, landing jobs in the UK using this pathway. Now the IELTS and the OET examination. So uh, both uh, are the uh, most commonly used English proficiency exams at the moment. Uh, can be taken in a written format or a computer-based test now available. Uh, uh, the time, uh, at what time should it be taken, can be taken any time. But uh, for UK, yeah, the exam should have been taken within the last two years when you're applying for the GMC registration. Now, uh, if you have to compare these two, uh, my personal choice would be OET, that is the Occupational English Test. Uh, reason being, uh, it's it's uh, it caters to the healthcare professionals. So uh, instead of going for some random uh, topics which you which which you can't expect in IELTS, uh, in OAT it's mostly uh, 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 history taking, for example, or consent, something like that. And uh, uh, the pass rate in general is higher in OAT. The only negative uh, for OET is uh, it's it's a bit costly. Uh, but uh, overall, in the long run, it's not going to matter much once you start. Come, uh, once you are in the UK and you start earning, so there's that. Uh, for IELTS, uh, the uh, the exam you need to take is the UKVI Academics. So there is a UK uh, General IELTS exam as well. Uh, but uh, you need to be sure there is a difference of the cost as well. So the exam you need to take is the UKVI exam. Uh, the maximum score is nine. What you need to achieve is uh, 7.5 overall with the minimum of seven in each of the following segments, listening, reading, writing, and speaking. And for OET, it has to be uh, grade B. Uh, the grades vary from A to E. Uh, what you need to score is B, a minimum. And the numeric score, which varies from zero to 500, uh, the minimum required is 350. Now, uh, we'll talk a bit about PLAB. Uh, 
So what lab is, essentially it's a licensing exam uh, and the maximum number of attempts uh, you're allowed is four. Uh, unlike in USMLE, uh, your PLAB score actually doesn't matter unless you're the highest scorer in that particular exam. Other than that, your score is not going to matter. And uh, it's it's just like a qualifying exam. You clear it, you get the GMC registration, and then you start applying for the jobs. So uh, PLAB 1, uh, it consists of 180 uh, MCQs, single best answer types. Uh, the time period allotted is three hours. It's mostly clinical subjects. Uh, again, this is a point where it differs from your simile. And it's a relatively e easier exam. Uh, people are able to prepare for it within two to three months. Uh, the results are issued after six weeks. And the, to be eligible for PLAB 1, you need to have uh, uh, an acceptable overseas primary medical qualification. What it means is... Uh, your college should be listed in the world directory of medical schools. And uh, uh, you can take this exam anytime after your uh, uh, final year examination has been done with. So the best time to take this exam would be <clears throat> your internship, which is also called the foundation year uh, here in UK. Uh, and uh, uh, the cost of the exam is, uh, it keeps on changing, but uh, uh, as far as I remember, at the moment, it's 230 pounds. The success rate is, it varies from 60 to 70%. Uh, and uh, on the screen, you can see the upcoming PLAB dates. And uh, the good thing about this exam is you can take it in your home country as well, if your country is one of the uh, countries listed on the GMC website. At the moment, I, I believe it's being conducted in 13 countries apart from UK. Uh, the PLAB 2 exam, uh, yeah, I would also like to mention uh, 2024 onwards, uh, the PLAB exam would be replaced by something known as the UK MLA, which is uh, set on a similar lines as USMLE. Uh, nothing to worry about. The exam is still the same. They're just changing the name. So PLAB 1 would be replaced by something known as AKT. Uh, so that would be applied knowledge test. Uh, the pattern is the same. Uh, it's again, you need, just need to pass the exam. The scores again are not going to matter. And uh, the PLAB 2 is going to be replaced by the CPSA, which is Clinical and Professional Skills Assessment. Again, a similar kind of pattern, which is it's an OSCE-based exam that is object, Objective Structural Clinical Examination. So it's essentially clinical stations. Uh, you, you'll be having 18 clinical stations. The exam duration is 3 hours and 10 minutes. Uh, thing about this exam is it can only be taken in the UK. And uh, it should be taken within two years of passing your lab one exam. And uh, it's a relatively costlier exam. Uh, the cost at the present is 850 pounds. Success rate, again, 65 to 70%. Uh, and it mostly concentrates on uh, aspects like history taking, uh, the management sections, uh, interpersonal skills, which uh, includes uh, how you deal with the patient. So what they are actually looking for is if you're if you're polite, if you're kind, if you're a safe doctor, and if you know what you're talking about. Uh, so what they are essentially judging is, are you able to work as a foundation year, uh, also called internship in some of the countries? Are you able to work as a good foundation year doctor in the UK? So again, uh, you just need to pass the exam. Uh, the scores they don't matter, and uh, uh, most people, uh, they, they prefer going for uh, one of the preparatory courses. Uh, there are a few courses conducted in UK. So what the, the routine which is being followed these days, especially in my country, is people book the exam in the UK. They come one or two months uh, prior to the exam date, and then they'll take this course, practice, and then appear for the exam. So yeah, uh, just a few more things I'd like to add at this point. So following uh, the PLAB 1 and PLAB 2 examinations, you apply for the GMC registration. Now, it's important that you create this GMC account beforehand. Uh, reason being, the number you're going to get is required for PLAB 1 examination, and that becomes your GMC registration number later on. Uh, once you're done with PLAB 1, PLAB 2, the English exams, uh, you get your GMC registration, which has to be done within two years of passing PLAB 2. And then you start looking for jobs. Uh, 
the first job recommended uh, is a tra non training job uh, people do apply for training jobs from outside uk as well but this is something which is not recommended considering you have no idea how nhs works so uh, uh, most people what they prefer is get the non trainee jobs first and uh, uh, what I would recommend is uh, take the PLAB 1 and PLAB 2 examinations when you're doing your internship at your home country. And uh, after you're done with the internship and the exams, uh, you can come to the UK, apply for uh, an SHO level or the foundation year level, which is equivalent to the internship in your country, uh, and uh, get used to the system first, and then start applying for the non-training jobs. Now, yeah. We'll talk a little bit about the Royal College route as well. Uh, so the Royal College examinations broadly can be categorized into MRCP, MRCS, uh, Member of Royal College of Physicians and Royal College of Surgeons. Uh, depending on the specialty, uh, you can always take the other Royal College routes. Uh, for anesthesia, it's different. For OBS and gynae, it's different. What it means is you're bypassing the PLAB route and uh, so these exams are also, uh, they're also required uh, uh, when you are applying for the specialist training. So what you're doing is uh, you're showing them that you are as competent as an intern and more. Uh, uh, I took the MRCS examination. Uh, I'll talk about that. So it consists of, again, two parts, uh, similar to uh, what lab was. Uh, part A is mostly MCQ-based questions related to your speciality. So if it's MRCS, it's mostly surgical, a bit of anatomy as well. And part B is uh, OSCE examination, again, clinical stations. Uh, MRCS part A, you can take in a few countries outside the UK. MRCS part B, again, you can take in a few countries outside the UK. For me, it was ENT, so I had to come to the UK to take that exam. It's not conducted outside the UK. Uh, the passing rate uh, decreases a bit because it's, it's a relatively difficult exam. Uh, and as you can see it on your screen, the pass rate of MRCS part A is 30 to 35% and in part B it's 57 to 60%. And the same applies to MRCP as well. So MRCP is for someone who is planning to go into the non-surgical specialities, something like internal medicine. And uh, the passing rate is relatively uh, better than uh, MRCS. Uh, in MRCP, uh, there are three parts, MRCS part uh, MRCP part one and two, uh, which are MCQ based exams, followed by MRCP PSS, which is again OSCE, uh, clinical based, uh, clinical stations based exam. Okay. Uh, now we'll talk a bit about GMC registration, the requirements of it. So, General Medical Council is the official medical council. All the doctors practicing in the UK, they need to be registered with the GMC. Uh, the documents which you required. Uh, for GMC registration are a valid international passport, a primary medical qualifications, uh, a primary medical qualifications, which is acceptable. That is uh, your uh, school needs to be uh, recognized with the World Directory of Medicine and uh, it needs to be EPIC verified. Uh, so it's uh, an online portal uh, which verifies your primary medical qualification. You need to clear your English exams. Uh, you need to have your internship completion certificate so uh, though you can take your exam uh, during your internship year, so internship is not a requirement for taking the exams, uh, but if you need to get the registration, you need to complete your internship first, uh, which will give you a full registration with a license to practice. Uh, there is a loophole in here. You can always uh, apply for registration before completing your internship as well, but that is not the full registration. That is a partial registration. And uh, you need to sign some competencies, get, get, get some competencies signed when you come to the UK. Not a recommended path. Yeah, okay. So yeah, I'll just briefly mention a little bit about how uh, the training system in UK works. So uh, in here, you finish the med school and then you apply for training uh, internship, which is also known as the foundation year. Uh, foundation year has to be done for a minimum of two years. Uh, some people, they prefer doing it for three or four years if they're not so sure which speciality they need to apply for. Uh, following that, you have three options. Uh, you can apply for a run-through speciality, which means uh, you're just gonna apply once 
enter the training pathway and after eight years you're going to be a consultant uh specialties like pediatrics ophthalmology neurosurgery radiology uh they follow this pathway run through specialties uh specialties they keep on changing uh, uh uh this year only or i think two or three years back ent was included in one of the run through specialties so you need to be updated with which specialties are following this route uh then there is a standard pathway which follows core training for the first one to three years uh there is a recruitment uh national recruitment happening at this level uh you apply for it and uh then you do two to three years of core training or uh, and you're known as core trainee one or two or specialty trainee one or two following which you decide if you need to go for a surgical specialty or a non surgical specialty depending on that you take the exam mrcp or the mrcs examination and uh again there is a national recruitment for various specialties uh, the competition ratios they vary but you work for another 3 to 4 years before becoming a consultant or there is a third option uh, which is very lucrative if it's money you are looking for it's the gp training the reason this specialty is is a uh, lucrative specialty especially amongst the immigrants is because the training duration is short it's it's just 3 years and after 3 years of training uh, you are a gp you get to work as a gp and uh, uh thing is you can be a consultant after 3 years instead of spending 7 to 8 years and you can practice outside the hospital as well uh, in small clinics known as gp surgeries and uh, yeah so there's that uh, the point of entry for you can be uh, at this level so once you clear the uh, mrc is uh, sorry lab examination you can apply for foundation year jobs work in the uk for 6 months 1 year 2 years decide on which specialty you want to pursue and then follow one of the routes or if you have already worked in a particular specialty for uh, say 1 years or 2 years you can always enter at this point after taking the mrcp or the mrcs examination yeah and uh, i'm not going to cover the cv uh, it has already been done we are falling short of time as well so yep okay uh, thank you so much for the presentation dr davanchu no worries at all uh, uh, i have a few questions uh, is there uh, time left to answer those questions yeah i'll i'll read the questions out for you questions. sure So someone asked if uh, how can he apply to the OBS and gynae or psychiatry program I believe he's asking if it's a run through program or do you have to go through the MRCP and MRCS and stuff uh yes so again it's a run through program uh, if you need to apply for it uh, if you want to enter the training pathway per se uh, the best route would be take the lab examination come to the UK apply for a non training job initially 6 months 1 year get your uh, crest form signed so the crest form essentially means uh, it recognizes the training you have already done in your country the internship you have done in your country uh, it will take that into regard so that you don't need to rep- uh, repeat the two year internship in here and then apply for the national recruitment during these two years uh, you build on your cv the portfolio and uh, get all the competencies required to appear for the national recruitment okay great uh, the second question is i'm currently an intern done with medical school but my certificate will not be given till after my internship can i still take the lab exam during my internship or do i have to wait till after my internship uh you can take the lab exam during your internship and uh, uh i don't think you required the proper degree even if you have a provisional uh, medical qualification which i believe is awarded uh, after your final year examination or you can have your final year score sheet as well that you passed that exam uh, you can appear for the lab 1 exam okay thank you Uh, the third question is: After passing the PLAB exams, is there any way I can get a visa to work as a medical assistant or any job before I eventually get a job as a doctor? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, I'm again, I'm not so sure about uh, this question, but I believe because PLAB examination is essentially giving you GMC registration, hmm. so you are registered with the medical council. So all you can apply for is a hospital job as a doctor. Uh, as a, as a medical assistant, uh, I'm not so sure how that is going to help. Okay. 
Uh, first question is, is PLAB acceptable in other countries? Uh, that's the PLAB exam itself, not the GMC registration. Uh, I think it is, but only after you have worked in UK for two years. Uh, it is recognized in Australia and New Zealand. In fact, uh, many of the doctors in here who have graduated from the medical schools in the UK, mm. uh, they do this thing. Uh, they clear. Uh, they work in here for two to three years and then go to Australia or New Zealand, work there for one or two years before coming back, or maybe they start working there only. But it is only acceptable if you have some UK experience as well. Okay, that's all. Um, do UK citizens and or graduates have a better chance at getting a job over IMGs, international medical graduates? Uh, not anymore. So uh, 2019 onwards, uh, all the specialities have been placed in shortage occupation. List, what it essentially means uh, there is no preference given to the UK graduates over immigrants. And uh, if you have a portfolio strong enough to compete with the native population in here, uh, you can always get into any speciality you want. It's just that because the graduates from in here, they have been working on their CVs and portfolios for a long, long time. Yeah. They get an edge in there. But if, if you can compensate for that somehow, uh, you can always get into any speciality you want. Okay. Do clinical attachments or electives in the UK help towards getting a job? Uh, definitely, yes. Uh, because that uh, that will be counted as UK NHS experience. Plus, uh, you get to make contacts uh, if, if, if uh, the consultant likes you in a particular department, uh, they'll be willing to create a job for you. So uh, it, it makes it easier to land your first job. Okay, during the clinical attachment, do you get to do any hands-on work? Do you get to examine patients or do anything like that? No. So what, uh, because for that, you need the GMC registration. Okay. And uh, in a clinical attachment, I'm assuming it's before you have applied for Plab one or uh, Plab two. If if you have cleared the Plab one, Plab two, put in your GMC registration, then I believe yes, you'll be allowed to do a little bit of clinical work. Okay, that's fine. Uh, those are all the questions that they asked. Thank you so okay. much for your presentation, Doctor Ravanchu. I really no worries, and sorry for the constant dropout. Uh, the network yeah, is a freak in here. That's yeah. totally fine. Uh, okay. It's for EMT. Can I join the practice even after three plus years of practicing uh, EMT, or should I take the Caesar route? So she's asking if she should take the normal club route, but she has three plus years of experience in EMT already. Uh, if the person in question uh, wants to pursue ENT in UK, I think it's a similar scenario which I had faced. So I had done four years of training in India in ENT. I would suggest skip club. Uh, take the MRCS ENT examination, uh, take a non-training job in the UK first. And after gaining an experience for say six months, apply for a training post, which I did. Uh, I had my interview on 12th, waiting for the results. If for some reason you're not able to get into training program because uh, there is a self-assessment questionnaire in which the uh, IMGs, uh, they're gonna lag behind because of the excess experience they have. Uh, they can always pursue the Caesar route, but training pathway is always the recommended route. Okay, and uh, someone asked if you can please briefly explain the core training program. Uh, the core training program in medicine or in general, the core the training medicine, program? The MRCP, the core training program, not the core surgical training program. So it, Okay, so, so uh, again, I, I, I don't think I have the complete information regarding that, but what I believe is after doing two years of foundation training, uh, you apply to be a core trainee in which you pick your specialities, uh, four monthly or six monthly rotations. And uh, after having worked as a core trainee for two years, uh, that, that the, uh, it can be uh, non-surgical specialities or uh, surgical specialities. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, after having worked there for two years, you develop an interest in one particular specialty. And uh, then uh, you take that qualifying examination for that specialty, for example, MRCP or MRCS for general surgery, and then you apply for one particular speciality, you can always apply for more than one speciality as well if you have that requisite amount of experience. Okay, understood. Now, this is for Mr. Pawan, Dr. Mm -hmm. uh, Bharat. Um, someone asked, what is the ERAS CV and what can I feel in the ERAS CV? So, uh, well, think of it as just a CV. So it is a curriculum vitae. It just has a separate standardized template uh, you cannot change the template and it'll go step by step, you know, your med school information, your uh, experiences, volunteer activities, hobbies, 
a research experience. So ERAS is the name given to the system that gathers all this information. Uh, it is the content that you put in maybe in a Word CV, uh, that's the same kind of content. Uh, the application, the entire application is that CV plus the personal statement, plus the letters of recommendation and some other med school information. But don't uh, let this complicate things. It's just a CV format. Okay. And um, is USMLE the only exam you can take to get into the US? Unlike the UK where you can take the MRCP or the MRCS to get into the... Yeah, so uh, 95 or more than 95, about 99% of the people will have to take USMLEs. There is a separate pathway for some specialties if you have done uh, residency in the back home in say radiology or things like that. Uh, otherwise, it is very hard. There are some uh, specialties that allow you to do fellowships, but even that will require USMLEs. Even the alternate pathway will require the USMLE. So without USMLE, I don't know. Bharat, is there, a, is there anything without USMLEs? Right. So um, uh, you're right. 99% of graduates uh, end up taking the SMB exams. The very few exceptions include uh, radiology and another specialty where you, uh, if you have trained outside, you're allowed to do a lateral transfer and uh, join fellowship and su subsequently gain a medical license in the US. But apart from that, the most notable exclusion is if you uh, graduate from LCME accredited college. So off the top of my head, there's only a couple that I know. Uh, one is Will Cornell in, in Qatar and one more, which uh, basically means that uh, their standard of education is comparable to the US uh, graduates and uh, out of Caribbean schools as well. So those are the only two very minor exceptions, but 99% of people end up taking No, US but even they will need to take USMLEs. Right, of course. They have yeah, to take. So there There's is, no way around. There is no the way USMLEs. around the USMLEs. <laughs> Okay, yeah. and Dr. Barat, you matched into a neurology program. Um, right. From what you have heard, it's not really an IMG friendly specialty. And we've also heard about the IMG friendly states like New York and uh, Florida, for example. Why do you think right. uh, that's the case? Why are uh, IMGs finding it difficult to match into other programs apart from internal medicine and family medicine and so on? Um. Right. So uh, if, if I understood the question correctly, it's, are you asking me why neurology is more competitive than I am? No, no. Why IMGs find it difficult to match into other programs? Uh, I, I can take that. I, I, can, I can take that. Sure, yeah. So, you know, the most IMG friendly specialties, internal medicine, family medicine, neurology, pathology, uh, pediatrics, uh, you know, so on and so forth. Why some of the other specialties are harder to get? Uh, a, because of the expected level of training and expected compliance with, say, the U.S. healthcare system. So take dermatology, take surgery, take, uh, uh, you know, ENT. These are very competitive, even for the American graduates. You know, the spots tend to be much lower, much less. There is much less of a spot. And even the American graduates, top of their class, find it hard to get into ENT and, uh, and some of this uh, plastic surgery, dermatology, etc. It is not that IMGs cannot match. They can. And it, it's a slightly longer road. Then the, they are expected to do research in the U.S. You know, they are expected to spend time in a university setting. They are expected to do publications and, and go through that grind, which, you know, takes time. So uh, many, and of course, uh, higher score. So uh, 260 plus, 270. So it's a combination of a lot of things, less spots, but the need to get very high scores, need to get into a university system, uh, which then a lot of IMGs do not have the time or the inclination to spend and all. And that's why you will see the, you know, the specialties that you see. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, this question for me, how can you write about the seminars and um, that we attend in the CV? So this goes under the section of commitment to medicine. You can't write it under any other section, but if you present in the webinar, then that's a different case. You will put that under an oral presentation. And do we have to show proof that we are uh, engaged in a charity and sports? Ideally, you have to. And I also forgot to add to... Um, 
on my presentation to tell the medical students not to lie on their CV. It has backfired and it will backfire. And um, <laughs> just don't lie. you ideally have to show proof. You can show a document or anything, uh, pictures maybe of you working in a charity group um, or the sports club. So Dr. Davanchu, um, I have a question for you. It says, if you study uh, for a master's degree, let's say in public health in the UK, um, can you bypass the whole PLAB MRCP route or do you still have to take it to pra practice public health in the UK? Uh, I am sorry, I don't think I know the answer to that question. By public health, uh, it, it, I'm assuming it's a non-clinical uh, yes. MS we are talking about. Yeah. 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 You still need to take the PLAB examination because that thing is not going to give you uh, entry to the GMC register. So uh, but, uh, license to... Yes, but you surely uh, can add it to the CV. It's going to help you in the uh, training pathway application. Okay. Uh, uh, it's going to give you some score in the self-assessment questionnaire, which is required to apply for any trainings, any speciality. But uh, uh, it's not going to give you an entry into the GMC register. Okay. Uh, so this is for the US side of things. Um, this question is Spanish is one of the most spoken languages in the world, particularly in the US. Does it add value to our application if we have a certificate that states we speak Spanish? So uh, you're right. Spanish is, after English, the most uh, commonly spoken language. Uh, but a majority of foreign graduates who come here do not know Spanish. Uh, it is good to have, obviously good to have, but it's not a deal breaker. There are only a few programs uh, that will require or uh, prefer Spanish. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's not a requirement. Don't, don't go over and beyond to, just to learn Spanish. If you've already taken it as part of your curriculum, you know it, great. Otherwise, uh, uh, it's not a requirement. Okay. Uh, for I just add on here. Uh... I just add on here as well that it's it's yeah. usually a requirement. It's not a requirement. Uh, it's not a formal requirement at all. In fact, every ACGME accredited program is required to have a 24 hour uh, Spanish interpreter. So it's absolutely not a requirement at all, but some programs typically in uh, Florida, I interviewed at a couple of programs there who prefer Spanish speaking graduates, but uh, every Florida program has a compulsory uh, a Spanish speaking course, medical Spanish speaking course that provides. So it's it's not crucial at all. Okay. Uh, so Dr. Bhatt, um, this question is for you, I guess, since you took the step one recently. <clears throat> question is, when should we take the step one? Uh, you may say whenever you are ready, but I'm kindly asking about the most appropriate grade, the third grade, fourth grade in medical school. Right. So uh, we recommend uh, to take the step one be at the end of the second year because of a multitude of wins. Uh, as you all know, it's, it usually tests the pre cl subjects. So right out of second year, you're very fresh. You're able to apply yourself better. But unfortunately, downside to that is you need to know well in advance that you're taking the US MLA journey and you need to be at least nine months or a year ahead of when you take the exam. You need to know that you're doing it. So uh, we uh, I highly recommend taking it at the end of the year, usually in third year, but most people who end up taking the exam will either be in the intern year or after the intern year. And there's no downside to it, except that you just have to weigh the pros and cons. The more time you spend preparing for the exam, the farther away you're going from your year of graduation. Uh, uh, some people like to believe that additional clinical exposure helps them solve those, those questions better. But I think that effect is negligible and I would still recommend taking it at the end of the second year. Okay, that's good. And we do have a complete <laughs> webinar on when to take step one and also it's on our YouTube channel uh, for those of you who may be interested. Okay. Um, another question for the US side of things. Do I have a chance at matching next year with steps only, OET and the letter of recommendation from uh, a doctor who has an office in the US? So he only has OET, uh, the steps, and one letter of recommendation. Does he have a chance at matching? So, yes. So, so typically, you know, a total of four or three, at least three recommendations are required. And while we do, you know, they prefer US uh, recommendations, but if you're just graduating and you have good scores, uh, one letter from the US will be, it should see you through. A lot depends on how your scores come out. 
uh, but absolutely you have a good chance if you at least have this complete application both scores oet uh, you will stand a good chance yes okay and the last question is for dr devanshu uh, is your cgpa your cumulative gpa and the university you graduated from uh, taken into consideration um, when you are applying for a training program in the uk uh, in short no no it isn't so all what matters is uh, is your cv uh, uh, given if if you have graduated from an a listed university in your home country uh, which the consultants in here are aware of and the, again that thing is going to add up to your cv in general in the application process uh, where you graduated from your score uh, they don't matter okay my apologies we have one last question uh, for the us side of things i will be graduating in 2024 is there a way i can know if my medical school will be accredited by the wfme by then uh i don't know if you know i mean you know this change of accreditation and and some of this is underway Uh, a lot of schools and countries in general uh, they are being impacted i i think we just need to wait a bit mm-hmm. i don't know enough about it bharat do you know if by when they will know and what the process is uh, yeah i can take this one so the the best person to know exactly when your medical school will be accredited is your school authorities uh, usually it takes on an average 2 to 2 and a half years after the the accreditation process begins for your school to be completely accredited uh, i can share a link of all the the med schools that are currently wfme accredited but Uh, you need not worry there is a new rule in place uh, which essentially says that if you apply for ecfmg certification and if you have your credentials verified in terms of your uh, your identity date of birth uh, there's a form 186 that has to be built uh, that be uh, filled and sent i think the cost is 150 dollars or so and if you do that any time before 2024 you will still be eligible to take the exam and this is not require to apply you for for the steps or anything you just have to have your credentials verified through the one form 186 okay um my apologies again apparently there are more questions in the chat box and i only realized um again for the us uh, side of things i have a question regarding the residency in the us for general surgery as an img what can i do uh, in order to have a greater chance in getting a general surgery program sure so like i said scores are very important you know so ck scores even if it step one goes pass fail scores are very important try to do electives in the us at some of these universities in surgery or related fields try to do research those would be the top 3 things you know scores uh, us electives and research uh, and you know that that should build a very good profile uh, for general surgery okay and um if you have specialized in the uk and want to further sub specialize in the us do you have to start from the beginning that means take the us mle and start from the internship level yes so uh, we do have certain students who have done uh you know their residency equivalent training in uk uh the uk experience is actually highly valuable in the us so if you have uh you know practice there if you have done your residency in the uk Uh, it is very very valuable here the irish uk experience but yes you still have to go through usmles you still have to do all that uh, they still <laughs> getting around that yes okay. yeah um this question is for me which type of volunteer work should be added to the cv any type of volunteer work should be added to the cv <clears throat> um you don't have to pick and choose any volunteer work actually works question will take for today how many attempts can you take in the us mle <clears throat> uh how many attempts i actually don't know uh, bharat do you know there's there's no limit to the number of attempts but the bottom line is that the us mle exam is uh, not very hard to fail uh a lot uh, most of the people who take the exam end up passing it but they do have uh, if if their score is not satisfactory the score remains on the file for a minimum of 7 years even if you fail the exam the fail attempt is still uh, recorded onto the system which uh, stays on your profile uh, so the plan is you can take it as many times as you want if you get a low score you have to wait for 7 years before that it is discarded before you take the exam again uh, and if you fail you can take it any time after it you don't have to wait but that fail attempt will still be scored on your report or will that fail um impact my chances of matching oh absolutely uh, there is no doubt about it 
failure and and low scores also uh, do impact and like bharat said uh, the unfortunate part is if you get a low score you cannot repeat the exam it is what it is uh, if you fail you can repeat it but they will all be reported mm-hmm. please avoid failures and low scores scores are very important it will follow you throughout your usmle journey yes Okay, so thank you so much. Uh, that's all we'll take for today. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bharat, uh, Dr. Devanshu, and also Mr. Pawan for your presentations. Um, uh, if you're fine with me sending your presentations to the participants, please send it to my email and then I'll forward it. I will do that and thank you for the opportunity. Okay, and uh, I just have one more announcement. We are holding another webinar in 30 minutes from now on our Facebook group. uh this is for applicants who are about to go into match next year so if anyone is interested uh look for usmle sarthi on facebook in 30 minutes we have our own webinar okay so thank you very much everyone have a great weekend thank you bye okay take care